Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just a reminder that inshallah on Thursday and Friday, this coming Thursday and Friday, we commemorate the departure of, of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And Saturday also we're going to have, tomorrow Saturday is going to be an Arabic program at 7 p.m. Next Saturday a Farsi program again at 7 p.m. inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala anbiya illahi jami'an. Wa ala sayyidihim wa khatamihim habibi ilahi alameen. Abil Qasim al Mustafa Muhammad. وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا ابن رسول الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله اصطفى آدم ونوحا وآل إبراهيم وآل عمران على العالمين ذرية بعضها من بعض والله سميع عليم Refresh your minds and your souls with a loud salawat for Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. We share the sorrow and the pain and the anguish and the grief and the mourning of the departure of Abu Abdullah al Hussein with the inhabitants of the sky, of the heaven. Al-Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam says, Bakat al-Sama ala Yahya ibn Zakariya wal Hussein ibn Ali arba'ina sabahan. The sky, the sky's reference to the angels, to the inhabitants of the heaven. We see the inhabitants of the earth human beings. There are other types of inhabitants who live up there. Those are the angels. Those are the souls and the spirits of many apostles and prophets and messengers that live with their Lord. Those inhabitants, they wept for 40 days for the departure of two heroes, two leaders. John the Baptist, Yahya ibn Zakariya, because he had the same fate like Imam Hussein. In fact, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, when he left the city of Mecca, going to Karbala, he left Medina to Mecca and then Mecca to Karbala. Throughout his journey, which lasted for 22 days. Throughout this journey, he would frequently remember John, Yahya ibn Zakariya. He would remember him. Because he's going to have the same fate. Yahya ibn Zakariya, Yahya ibn Zakariya, uhdiya ra'suhu ila baghiyin min baghaya bani Israel. His head, he was killed by the order of the Roman Emperor, Heridus. And then his head was given as a gift to an unchaste lady. Because 
the emperor wanted to have a relationship with her, Yahya stood in his palace. He said, this is illegal. You would not do that. So she holds a grudge in her heart against him. And when the king wanted to have a relationship with her, he asked her, what type of gift you want? She said, if you are serious about giving me a gift, I want, me, I want you to kill Yahya and give his head as a gift to me. They murdered Yahya. They put his head in a platter. And they bring the platter to this unchaste woman. The same thing happened to Imam Hussein. They murder him. They put his head in a platter. And they put it in front of Yazid ibn Muawiyah in Damascus. The people of the inhabitants, they wept for 40 days. For those two universal leaders who do not belong only to the people on the earth. They represent universal values, universal standards. A universal personality like Al Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam transcends all boundaries. All boundaries. He touches the hearts. He inspires the hearts of all people, Muslims and non-Muslims. And I mentioned last night and today during the Friday prayers, and I'm going to mention this for the third time tonight, that an ex-Congresswoman, an African-American Congresswoman from the state of Georgia, she walked this path, this journey, from the father to the son. From the shrine of the father, who lost all his sons. A father who is grieving. He lost 10 of her ch his children on the day of Ashura. 10, not one or two. He, she walked from Najaf to Karbala. She said, because this was my dream to walk this path, to celebrate and commemorate a hero who stood for justice, who stood for peace, who stood for equality. Human values, my friends, are unbounded by any boundaries or frontiers. They are unbounded. They have no limits. They are not bounded by race or culture, or color, or ethnicity, or even religion. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he spoke a universal language. His language was not Arabic. His real language was universal. He carried a universal heart. His message was universal. His thoughts were universal. Therefore, he does not belong a piece of land called, called Karbala, no, neither to a group of people called Muslims or Shias. And this is what we saw vividly during this march that ended today in Karbala. Friday was the day of Arba'in there. And the official figures of the authorities they say 14 million people walked to the shrine of imam hussein 14 million people in this universal march where you find all sort of people 80 countries participated they carried their banners all colors all walks of life different types of people among them non-muslims among them non-Arabs, among them non-Shias, among them people who have been there for the very first time in their life. They wanted to experience this spiritual journey, not physical, spiritual journey. 
A journey where people during that journey they reflect on their life. They reflect on these principles that Imam Hussein gave his life for them. They get inspired by Imam Hussein and his message. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he carried the suffering of the people in the past and the present. The sufferings that are exemplified today, when you look at the humanity, you look at these sufferings right before your eyes, exemplified today in discrimination that we see, in racism which is spreading, in injustice that is enshrining many human societies, in bigotry, in arrogance, in the rejection of a truth and justice, in dictatorship that we see today, dictatorship that does exist in many Muslim countries today. Imam Hussein represented these sufferings. He represented people who, who don't have a shelter, who don't have food. I mentioned today a painful figure from an Islamic country. An Islamic country which is part of the Arabian Peninsula. Arabian Peninsula in terms of natural resources is the richest place on earth, my friends. No place is richer than the Arabian Peninsula with natural resources. Yet, the people of Yemen in the south of this peninsula, not too far, in the south, according to the United Nations yesterday, Yesterday, they declared that 6.8 people, Yemeni people, are at the verge of starvation. Starvation. 6.8 million people. Almost 7 million people. At the verge of starvation. In the richest area, in the richest geographic area on earth. Is this justice? Is this equality? Is this a humanity? Is this Islam? Is this Islam that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam preached? Are these the principles of this book? In a country where they only print this book, but they don't practice it, including this one in my hand, printed in that country, but they don't practice it. They print the book, they give it to you as a gift when you go to Hajj, but yet, they don't hesitate in killing their neighbors, in bombing their neighbors, in placing an embargo on their neighbors. So food and medicine and help cannot reach that country. This is not Islam. This is not a humanity. This was the situation during the time of Imam Hussein, my friends. If you want to look, have a glance, quick glance at Bani Umayyah, at the time of Muawiyah, before him and after him, his son Yazid, this is, this is an example of what was happening at that time. Bloodshed, discrimination, dictatorship, injustice, starving people. Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan was the first caliph who followed the policy of starving his opponents. He used to give instructions to his commanders, military commanders. If you find someone, if you suspect, not if you find, if you suspect someone sides and supports Ali ibn Abi Talib, stop his salary from Baytul Man. Let his children starve. Wahdimu alayhi darah. Demolish his house upon him and his family. This was his policy. This policy are being pursued now by Al Saud in the Arabian Peninsula. Just because some free people in Yemen who do not be their subordinates, they don't want to follow them. Therefore, they have no right to live, no right for treatment from cholera. No right to eat. Imam Hussein represents those people. 
Are you surprised when the Yemenis, they go into the streets and they say, Ya Hussein? Of course. Because Imam Hussein, his message resonates only, only with the poor, with the oppressed, with the mahrumin, not with the arrogance. The arrogance, they do not relate to Imam Hussein. Dictators do not relate to Imam Hussein. But those who are being neglected, those who are being wronged, they know the meaning of Hussein. They follow the message of Hussein. They find in Hussein a shelter for their pains and their sufferings. Therefore, they call upon Hussein. They call upon him. They look up to him. They look up for freedom to free themselves. They look up to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. 14 million people when they go, and this is a real number without any exaggeration, real number. Many of those people who go to Iraq, who walk this distance to the shrine of Imam Hussein, at least 80 kilometers, they go there to learn. They go there to get touched and inspired by Hussein alayhi salam. One day, Gandhi, the leader who liberated India, he said a sentence, this sentence still reverberates in the world. He said, I was someone who was oppressed. I was oppressed in my country. My country was occupied. My people were occupied. They were subjected to all sorts of humiliation and wrongdoing. But I found in Hussein a lesson how to be wronged and how to fix that problem and free myself from captivity. I learned that from Hussein alayhi salam. This past Ashura, many Muslim countries, including Saudi Arabia, who consider themselves to be the guardian, the wali of all the Muslim ummah. You know they were celebrating Ashura with the music, with festivities. You know that they considered these 10 days of the first 10 days of Muharram. I, I don't know how many of you follow the news. Ask Saudi students who study here. Ask them about that. They will verify it for you. They considered these 10 days, which are the days of sorrow and sadness and solidarity with the Prophet wasallam, Solidarity with Ahlul Bayt for the tragedy of Ashura. In Saudi Arabia, they considered these days as days of national celebration. National celebration. And they had parties and fun and festivities. And they completely neglected Ashura and Imam Hussein. While in India, India, a country with a majority of Hindus, they commemorated the day of Ashura. Do you know in India they issued a stamp, stamp, national stamp, with the name of Imam Hussein on it, 50 years ago, 50 years ago, commemorating Imam Hussein, while the Muslims, Muslim countries, Arab countries, 55 Islamic countries, they neglected the day of Ashura. You cannot find a single street in Saudi Arabia named as named after Imam Hussein alayhi salam. But you will find many streets named after Abu Huraira. You can find a street named after Abu Sufyan in the heart of Mecca. In the heart of Mecca. You know one of the oldest markets in Mecca was Souq Abi Sufyan? Souq. Named after Abu Sufyan. But no street named after Imam Hussein. You go to Mumbai. I went with the Ilahi family to Mumbai. And I saw one of the main squares in Mumbai. Main squares is named after Imam Hussein alayhi salam. A street named after Abbas alayhi salam. Why? Because free people with a free spirit and a free mind, they relate to Imam Hussein. They respect Imam Hussein. Even if they don't follow the same religion, but they follow the same path. 
path that leads them to dignity, path that leads them to freedom. So Imam Hussein is a universal figure. You would not be surprised why the inhabitants of the heaven and, and the earth, they weep for Imam Hussein alayhi Every single human who feels wronged and neglected worldwide finds shelter and refuge in Imam Hussein alayhi Imam Hussein alayhi salam has settled in our hearts, deeply in our hearts. And therefore nothing can affect him. Nothing can dislodge him from your heart. My friends, there are two types of love in this life. Sometimes you love someone or something because of material gains. You love someone because he provides you with hot meals, delicious meals. So you love that person. I know some children, they love their mothers only because she cooks good meal for them, good food. Not because she's a mother, not because she gives them love or compassion or care or protection. You ask him, why do you love your mother? Wow, because she cooks good food for me. The same with some husbands, by the way. Sometimes you find you, you love someone because he has a good house. You go to his house, you enjoy his house. You enjoy riding in his car because he has a fancy car for material gains. But sometimes you like someone not because he has a good house, good food, good car, money, or these things. You love him because of his heart, because he's a truly human. Human, he carries a human soul. Because he's an honest person because he's a truthful person, because he's a person of integrity in this life, because he's a person of purpose and service in this life. So you fall in love with him because of his heart, not because of his money. This is a true love. The first type of love where you fall in love with a person because of his materials, that type of love is going to expire one day. But the second type of love, when you love someone because of his ruh, his soul, his qalb, his heart, when you, you love him because of his nobility, because of his character, because he's a true humanity, that type of love is everlasting. That type of love is eternal. That type of love is not going to expire. We love Imam Hussein. The second type of love. Not because of his size or his color. We have not seen him. We don't even know anything about his color or his size. Not because of his money. We know nothing about his money and his property. We love him because of his values and his principles. This type of love is not going to expire. This type of love is eternal. And therefore, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam says, Inna lil Husayni mahabbatan maknoonatan fi qulub al-mu'mineen. For Hussein, there is a special place in the hearts of the observants. Maknoona, deeply rooted. It cannot be evicted. It cannot be taken out of your heart. And that love is renewed every single day. Not just every single year, every single day. In the words of my friend, he says, I go to many places. The only place that when I go, while I am there, and while I am about to leave, I long to go again. Even before I finish my first ziyarah, I want to go the second one, the third one, the fourth one. My heart is connected to Hussein. My heart is connected to the grave, to the shrine of Hussein. Deeply rooted. This is the description of Imam al Sadiq. There is no exaggeration in that. Deeply rooted. Deeply connected. Look at your heart. Your heart, if they open your heart, they find nothing but Hussein. Hussein that represents 
all the good values in this universe. Hussein that represents monotheism, Tawheedullah. Hussein that represents the Nubuwa, the messengerhood, the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam. Hussein that represents the sacrifice of all the Anbiya. Thus, when you stand before him, you say, Assalamu ala Adam Safwatillah. You don't just address Hussein. Hussein is the continuation, the extension of the prophets. You stand before Hussein in Karbala, but you remember Adam. Assalamu ala Adam Safwatillah. Assalamu ala Nuh al Nabiillah. Assalamu ala Ibrahim Khalilillah. Assalamu ala Musa Kalimillah. Assalamu ala Isa Ruhillah. You greet all the prophets. Why? Because Imam Hussein exemplifies all the prophets. All the goodness in this universe are centered in a man called Abu Abdullah al Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salatu wassalam. Imam Hussein alayhi salam has a beautiful expression. He says, Ana qatilu al abra. Ma dhakarani mu'minun wa la mu'minatun illa wa bakaya. I am a person who has been murdered for tears. No believer, male or female believer, remember me, but they weep. Look at yourself. Whenever we say, Ya Hussein, whenever we say, Assalamu alayka, Ya Aba Abdullah, can you hold yourself? Can you hold your tears? They are, these are spontaneous. It comes from your heart. This means you are connected to Imam Hussein. Even if you live far away from him, your soul is with Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. And then some people say, Aren't you tired of grief and sorrow? My friends, this type of grief and sorrow is not just emotional. It is intellectual and spiritual too. We need this to grow. When we connect to Imam Hussein and we weep for him, we are learning in this process of tears, and weeping, we inspired by him. We get inspired. We learn from him. We make a covenant that we are following you, Ya Aba Abdullah. I want to be with you. I want to be in your group. Ya Laytana Kunna Ma'akum Fanafuza Fawzan Azim. We never say this about any prophet, neither any Imam. We only say it. When we speak to Imam Hussein, Ya Laytana, I wish I was with you and with your companions. Kunna ma'akum, fanafuza fawzan azima. We will achieve real success and real victory. So there is no shame, no embarrassment in tears. Imam Hussein is an exception. Imam Hussein, before his martyrdom, 50 years, half a century, the first person who wept for him was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The riwayat says, every single prophet that God sent to the humanity wept for Imam Hussein alayhi sallam. Every single prophet. Allah would tell them about what will happen. Every single prophet Allah informed him about Prophet Muhammad and he informed him about the fate of the family of Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam. And among these news was the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. Adam, he wept. Adam wept. Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa. Many of them, God allowed them to pass through the land of Karbala. Before the tragedy of Ashura, they passed through the land of Karbala to stand there and pay tribute to Hussein. Because without Hussein, their messages would expire, would come to conclusion. It was Imam Hussein who kept the name and the legacy 
of those prophets of Musa alayhi salam, Isa, before him Ibrahim, before him Nuh. Through his sacrifice, he kept their messages alive. The hadith says, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. إذا أحب الله تعالى عبدا نصب في قلبه نائحة من الحزن. This hadith is very amazing. If God loves a person, Abdan, one of his servants, he would install his heart a trace, a trace of lamentation and sadness. The Prophet says, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى يُحِبُّ كُلَّ قَلْبٍ حَزِينٍ God loves every heart that are sad. Every heart that, that is sad, God loves that heart. وَإِنَّهُ وَإِنَّهُ لَا يُدْخِلُ النَّارَ مَنْ بَكَى مِنْ خَشْيَتِهِ God made a vow that I will not punish on the day of judgment a person who weeps out of my fear and my love. So sadness is something good. And there is no contradiction between being happy, smiling, and being sad inside your hearts. Al-Mu'min, one of the characteristics of a believer, Bishruhu fi wajhihi wa huznuhu fi qalbih. He keeps, a good believer, keeps sadness in his heart, but he expresses happiness with his smile on his face. So even if he is smiling, there is some sadness in his heart. Why? Why he should be sad? He should be sad if you read the Quran. Prophet Muhammad was sad. Why he was sad? Read the Quran. He was sad because when he sees people are rejecting the truth. People are not implementing fairness and justice. People are not thanking God for what he has given them. He would be sad. Those people who know the Lord very well, they know the status of the Lord, Ma'rifatullah, the more they know the Lord, the more they know we are not doing enough for our religion, for God. We are not doing enough. They become sad. Also, they become sad for the tragedies that are taking place. I swear by God, when I look at what is happening in Yemen, to those children, especially nowadays, when they show on television, people with a skeleton, children, women, elderly, if you follow the news, you will see them. People who are dying in hundreds because of no food. I hold myself responsible. Though I live far away from them, I blame myself. I would not enjoy my food. When I see people now, people are dying because of an embargo of dictators, tyrants, corrupt sheikhs, corrupt sultans and kings among us. You would not enjoy your food. You would not enjoy your sleep. When you see there, are, there is... There are two, pil two billion people worldwide are undernourished. Two billion people. When you see the poor and the needy, you would not, you would not, your heart would not be happy. Definitely you, you, will sad, you will be sad and you sympathize with those people. This is the meaning of the sadness in the heart. When your heart is sad, this is an indication you are on the right path. This is an indication you are a true human being. Amir al-Mu'mineen, one of the poetries that he recited, he said, مَا إِن تَأَوَّحْتُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ رُزِئْتُ بِهِ كَمَا تَأَوَّحْتُ لِلْأَيْتَامِ فِي الصِّغَرِ Nothing disturbs me. Nothing brings down my tears and my pain like when I see an orphan right before my eyes, it breaks my heart when I see an orphan. 
an orphan who lost his dad. A dad who's supposed to spoil his son or his daughter, take care of them, feeds them, teaches them, be an example to them, protects them. When they lose this protection, I feel sad for them. I can't enjoy my days and my nights. Amir al-Mu'mineen, whenever you look at his face, before Khilafah and after Khilafah, he was sad. He was sad for the condition of the Ummah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the riwayat says, Rasulullah was smiling, but yet there is sadness and pain in his heart. Especially the day that he went for the Isra and Mi'raj, the ascension. Allah allowed him to see part of the paradise and part of the hellfire. The Prophet saw it with his eyes. When he came back to the earth, لم يرى ضاحكا حتى توفاه الله. He never laughed. He smiled, but he never la laughed until the day he died. Until the day he died. Sometimes I think, how can we laugh when we remember we are going to be taken to a grave, dark grave, sooner or later? When we remember the new house. When we remember that family, friends are going to bid farewell to us, they take us to a dark place, we're going to stay there. You would not be happy after that. These are realities, my friend. Inna Allah Ta'ala yuhibbu kulla qalbin hazin. Allah loves every heart which carries sadness and sorrow with it. A Hindu person asked two days ago this question. He asked, how can the pain and the suffering of Imam Hussein be a blessing to the Shia community too? How can pain and suffering, on the one hand, get along with the blessings and victory on the other hand? Tell me about this. So I answered, I said, I'll give you a couple of examples in our life. How can pain and suffering results in victory and results in blessings at the same time? There is suffering, but there is blessings in that suffering. This is why Imam Hussein accepted his fate. He did not accept his fate reluctantly. When the Prophet informed him and he was a child, he was a still a child. Nowadays, if there is some bad news, you don't tell your son or your daughter if they are 10 years old, 15 years old, even sometimes 20 years old. You shield them. You protect them. The Prophet informed Imam Hussein about his martyrdom when Hussein was only five years old. Because every time the Prophet looks at Hussein, he would cry. So Hussein asked him, Daddy, why do you cry every time you look at me? The Prophet had to tell him what will happen to him. He said, Hada Jibrail. Jibrail is telling me that your murder is going to take a place in the land of Karbala by people who say we are Muslims. They claim they are Muslims. This is what will happen to your family to your sisters, to your daughters, to your companions. So he informed him about that. Imam Hussein knew since a very young age, he knew what will happen to him. So now how we can have this, this is why he accepted that. Imam Hussein accepted martyrdom wholeheartedly. He never said to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, why this happens to me? I don't want this to happen to me. I want to live. I hate to be killed. Not even he accepted that reluctantly. He accepted that wholeheartedly, with love, with conviction, with acceptance, with happiness, with rida, rida. Rida Allah, ridana ahl al-bayt. This is what he says in Mecca. He stood inside Masjid al-Haram, he said, 
خط الموت على ولد آدم ما خط القلادة على جيد الفتاة. Oh people, I'm telling you, I'm going to Iraq. I'm not going to gain government there. I'm going for martyrdom. Because mouth, death is surrounding our necks just like a necklace that surrounds the neck of a lady. وما أولهني إلى أسلافي اشتياق يعقوب إلى يوسف. I am longing for my predecessors, for my father, for my mother, for my grandfather. The same way Yaqub for 40 years he was weeping and waiting to meet his son Yusuf. So Imam Hussein was waiting. And then at the end he said, Ridha Allah, Ridana Ahl al Bayt. Whatever pleases God pleases us. No separation between the pleasure of God and the pleasure of Ahl al Bayt. It's one. Sometimes us. Because our faith is not, is not healthy, is not good. You know why it's not good? Because we are attached to this dunya. We are attached to materialism. We are attached to our properties. We are attached to our children. We are attached to the dunya. We are attached to the position here. We are attached to fun and entertainment. We can't break free from these things. Therefore, sometimes God's pleasure is different from my pleasure. God says, Mustafa, I want you to do this. I say, oh no, come on. Why me? Send someone else. And if we accept, sometimes we accept reluctantly. Reluctantly. Not because we are convinced. As I said today in the Friday prayer, someone came with me to Hajj. Many years ago, he said, Sayyid, you know why I'm here in Hajj? I hate to come to Hajj. The reason why I am here, I don't want to go to the hellfire. Otherwise, I would not come to Hajj. But I have to come. And I gave this in comparison with the ziyar of Imam Hussein. Those 14 million, none of them would tell you I am here because if I don't come, God is going to send me to hellfire. No, they say I am here. I am here because I love Hussein. I'm ready to do this again and again and again. This is the difference. So Ahlul Bayt, their pleasure is the same as God's pleasure. No separation. Whatever God tells them, they say, yes, sir, immediately. Without any delay. Ridha Allah, Ridhana Ahlul Bayt. Imam Hussein was happy to go for martyrdom. Before him, Imam Ali, he says, Wallah, by the Lord. لابن أبي طالب آنس بالموت من الطفل إلى ثدي أمه. Have you seen? Do you have little babies? Huh? I sometimes I watch them. I observe them. Little babies, few months old, they long for their mother's milk. They cry. The best gift to give them is to give give him back to his mother so she can nurse him, give him food. Amir al-Mu'minin says, "This is mine." Me, when it comes to death, I'm like a baby who's longing for his mother's breast to eat, to drink. I'm waiting for death. I'm happy with death. I'm not afraid of that. So in my answer to this Hindu friend who said, how come you have suffering and pain and at the same time, this is a blessing. I gave two examples. Example number one, many of the mothers in this session, they, they realized. A pregnant mother, at the time of delivering her baby, she entails a lot of pain. Excruciating pain. Some of them, they say, this is my last time. I would never get pregnant again because of the pain. Because of the pain. But then, seconds later, she smiles. Before, few seconds before, she says, I'm dying. She screams, I'm dying. And she, she really sees death. But seconds later, she smiles when the baby comes out, when she delivers the baby. So this is at labor. You can see at labor. There is pain, but at the same time, there is a blessing. There is a smile. There is hope. There is a new baby, new future. A new love, a new happiness in their life. So you can have 
You can have them at the same time. Suffering, pain, and blessings at the same time. Another example, when someone undergoes a surgery, open heart surgery, there is a lot of pain before the surgery, during the surgery, after the surgery. But once the surgery is done, he says, I have a new life. I can breathe now. I can walk. I can exercise. So there is a blessings. He had to go through that surgery. The surgery entailed pain, but the results were blessings. The same thing with Imam Hussein. Yes, Ashura is a tragedy, big tragedy, when they murdered Imam Hussein. Not just because they murdered him, when he sees his children are being murdered right before his eyes. This is not easy, my friends. Wallah al azim this is not easy. If your son, if your daughter, they, they get fever at night, one night, you can't look at them. You can't watch this. Imam Hussein, he saw his children being killed right before his eyes. One after the other. One after the other. His brothers, his nephews, his friends, his companions of 60 years who were with him. One after the other. At the end, he came, he said to those people, I want to spare this baby, he's only six months old. If I am guilty, this baby has no guilt. They killed that baby. They killed that baby right before his eyes. These are sufferings. But out of these sufferings, look at the victory. Look at Arba'in. Look at millions of people who march. Look at millions of people worldwide who say, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. They don't forget Imam Hussein. This is victory. When you look at Hussein today, when you look at Karbala, when you look at every village, every country, every city, every town that is Husseiniya, named after Hussein alayhi salam. When you look at millions of people being guided and inspired and saved from damnation by Hussein alayhi salam, this is the grand victory. This is the victory. This is the blessing. This is the blessing. Imam Hussein is not a loser. Imam Hussein did not lose on the day of Karbala. Imam Hussein made a good deal with God. He made the best type of investment, Imam Hussein. This investment is mentioned in the Quran. Allah says, هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ تِجَارَةٍ تُنْجِيكُمْ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Do you want me to show you tijara, business, investment, that is going to protect you and save you and bring you dignity and honor? Give your wealth and your soul, your souls to God. This is exactly what Hussein did. Hussein gave his material wealth and his spiritual wealth. Material wealth, his money. The last penny, alayhi salam, Hussein had with him, 4,000 dinars at that time. When he arrived in Karbala on the second day of Muharram, he purchased that spot in Karbala. He paid the money to Bani Asad, the owners of that land. He told them, listen, I want to own this land. They were surprised. A man who's passing by this land, why does he want to buy this land? They didn't know. He said, I want to buy the land from you. Because he knew his grave is going to be in this land. He gave them the money. He spent his last penny on buying a grave for himself and for his companions. What a beautiful grave is this. What a beautiful grave is this, the land of Karbala. كل أرض كل يوم عاشوراء وكل أرض كربلاء. It's worth it. It's worth it four thousand to pay four thousand for that land. It's really worth it. Sacred land. And he spent his spiritual wealth too. His children. Your children are your spiritual wealth. You invest your life on your children. But when it comes to God and God says, Hey, I want your son from you. You tell him, here you are, my son, my daughter, myself. 
my oldest son Ali al Akbar, my very youngest son Ali al Azgar Abdullah, I'll give them for you. He made the best deal. So this is how we see suffering and pain, but at the same time victory and success and a triumph. This is how we look at Hussein. My friends, on the day of Arba'een, the most important event that took place is when Imam Zain al Abidin came back from captivity, from a journey of 40 days with his family. They passed through many cities, many towns. Some of these cities, they did not recognize the family of the Prophet, so they called them names. They slandered them. In some cities, they recognized them when they saw the daughters of Imam Hussein, when they saw Sukaina alayhi salam speaking, Zainab speaking, Imam Zain al Abidin. They realized that this is the family of the Prophet. They helped them, they sympathized with them, they respected them. So after 40 days, Imam Zain al-Abideen brings all these heads. The heads were separated from the bodies and he rejoins them. There is a reunion between the bodies and the heads, the separated heads of 72 people. Imam Hussein, his family members and his companions. But look what the head of Imam Hussein did. The head of Imam Hussein separated from the body and it's at the top of the lance or spear being carried from one place into another. That head which is separated from the body made several miracles down the road. One of them was a Christian priest who was sitting in front of his monastery. And when he looks at this head, he realizes that this is a special person shining with beauty, with light. He said the head was like a fresh head. I could look at it, fresh head, as if this man is not killed, this man is alive. So he took the head, he gave them 10,000 dirham, silver coins, to that army. He said, I want to host this head in my temple tonight. He took the head. They said, okay, just give us the money. They took the money from him. He hosted the head. He washed the head of Imam Hussein. He said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, this is all the money that I have. If I had more than that, I would give to keep you with me, to respect you, treat you with respect. Those people, they disrespected you. I want you to tell your grandfather, the Prophet, when you meet him, tell him that Fulan, me, and I ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad al Rasulullah. That was one incident. The second incident, when the caravan on their way from Damascus to Karbala on the day of Arba'een. They came from Damascus to Karbala. From Karbala, their final leg of their trip from Karbala back to Medina. But on their trip from Syria, from Sham, Damascus to Karbala, in the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula, in the Sham territories, they passed by a small town. In that town, they had to rest. And with them was the head of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. A lady came, an old lady, maybe in her 80s, 90s. She came, she spoke with the women. She came to Lady Zainab alayhi salam. She said to her, she didn't recognize her. She did not recognize Lady Zainab. She said to her, I've been waiting here for more, more than 50 years now. I stop on, on the highway here to watch the caravans, waiting for a special caravan to arrive. Zainab said, why you are waiting for a special caravan? She said, because my son, more than 50 years ago, got sick. And they told me 
if you want real cure, go to the Prophet of Islam in Medina. He will cure through his prayers and his blessings. He will definitely cure your son for you. I carried my son and I traveled to the city of Medina. I went to Masjid al-Nabi. I met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I went to his house. It happened that there were some children in his house. I said to him, Ya Rasulullah, my son is very sick. I don't want him to die. So please pray to God. Through a miracle, he will give back cure and recovery to my son. She said, next to the Prophet, there was a young boy sitting next to the Prophet. The Prophet said to me, yes, I will. And he turned to this young boy. His name was Hussein. The Prophet said to him, Hussein, I want you to wipe the head of this boy, this little child who is sick. So Hussein, he puts his hand on the head of my son. He wipes his head. And Allah gives my son the shifa and the recovery. So I turned to the Prophet. I said, Ya Rasulullah, how can I return this favor to you? The Prophet said to me, listen, I don't want any money from you. I, I'm not expecting any monetary reward from you. The only thing I expect, if you want to return the favor, this boy is going to pass through your town one day, not now, in many years from now, with his family. His family are going to be captives. When they pass through your area and your town, I want you to honor them and respect them. So the lady is telling the story to Sayyida Zainab, not knowing that this is a story. This is Lady Zainab. Lady Zainab turned to her. She said to her, my sister, do you want to see that little boy? Do you want to see him? Look at the spear. Look at this head. This is the head of Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. Afatim, afatim, law khilt al Hussein mujaddalan. أفاطم لو خلت الحسين مجدلا وقد مات عطشانا بشط فراتي إذا للطمت الخد فاطم عنده وأجريت دمع العين في الوجنات وحسينا